Good morning folks, I trust you're well. We're looking for some encouragement again today, and as we do so, we turn to our Bible reading challenge and the letter to the Philippians. I mentioned that yesterday, as we started this letter, that there may well have been a bundle of letters together, maybe three letters that the Philippians had received and they've placed together. And this is certainly seems to be one of them. Chapters one and two are thought to be certainly parts of the same letter. Um, so we're going to get some encouragement from that. And I guess the, the theme of that we want to really think about is following Christ's example. Um, Paul's trying to encourage people. He's been trying to encourage us by extension as well. Um, and hopefully we are encouraged by what he has to say. And when we receive a letter, we can be encouraged by that. Whether it's a letter or these days maybe an email or a postcard, whatever it might be. We're encouraged to receive a message of goodwill from somebody else. And certainly Paul was endeavouring to encourage people with that. So let's just see what he has to say in Philippians chapter 2 and see also the admonition we get as he goes a little bit deeper into things in relation to the person of Christ himself. So let's to the Philippians chapter 2 from the beginning. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. You may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you will shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of God, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labour in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how, as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him, just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, for, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all, and has been distressed, because you heard he was ill. Indeed he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honour such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Amen. Just those final points there when Paul talks about 
um, things that might have been lacking in the service of the, the Philippians to, to him himself. I think we're to understand that really, that just because they weren't present with him and able to minister to him uh, face to face, um, that's really what he's talking about here. He's not blaming them for that. He's just identifying the fact that, well, you couldn't be here face to face with me to support me in the way that you might have wished. But your own friend and brother Epaphroditus is available there. And he has been there serving with me and, and helping me in so many different things. We also saw yesterday at the start of reading the letter that the letter was from Paul and Timothy. Timothy, no doubt, is beside Paul as he's writing this letter. And he looks forward to going to see them and to encourage them and also bring back a word of encouragement to Paul as well if he can't leave uh, where he's incarcerated, probably in Rome, uh, at this particular time. Um, so he, he looks for that wee bit of encouragement. But there are other things in here that I find particularly interesting, and maybe you do as well, and that's this encouragement to humility. Paul encourages us never to think too much of ourselves. That's not to say that we shouldn't be proud of what we're able to ch achieve. That's not what he's talking about. But that we just want to be a little bit careful that we're not too full of ourselves. And, and it's so easy to, to be filled with pride um, and filled with that kind of angst that really, to be honest with you, it, it compromises us. It, um, it undermines our own efforts. And, and it certainly doesn't help other people to look favorably, favorably either upon us or what we might have to say. And so not thinking too much of ourselves is a really good thing. And Paul encourages us here to that extent. And he also, in, in that context, invites us to follow the example of Christ. And it's in this regard that we have some very interesting words that we just want to maybe, maybe pick up on just for a moment. I just want to reread these verses. These are verses that are sometimes taken out of, con out of context. Um, you may recall that in, in previous times, earlier in this year, I made the comment that the Apostle Peter had a complaint, if anything, not that what Paul was saying was wrong, but sometimes because it was difficult or maybe um, put in a way that was difficult to understand or he was delving into deep things, that sometimes people misunderstood them or they twisted his words to mean something that they didn't mean. And so we find an example of that early on in this chapter. And there are those in our own day and age that would misuse this particular passage of scripture talking about Christ to suggest that somehow Christ isn't equal with God the Father and God the Spirit. So they really try to strike at the, 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 uh, the, the heels, if you like, of the Trinity doctrine. And one particular group are the Jehovah's Witnesses, for an example of this. And there are others as well. And I'll, I'll, I'll pick out where it is they get their ideas from and, and just try to elaborate on that. So we're a little bit more uh, clear in our minds as to what Paul is actually trying to say here. Uh, I'll, I'll read from verse, um, verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and having been found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. So in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And so on, um, uh, Paul goes on here. It's one of these long, long sentences because you know, there was uh, no use of uh, punctuation. It's a long, long sentence, really concentrating on, on Jesus himself. However you want to read that, certainly after his death and resurrection, it's making clear that Jesus has that name above every name. There's an equality with God at that point, at the very least, no matter how someone might like to twist Paul's words. But he also talks about Jesus having taken two different forms, that, that before he was on earth, he had the form of God. When he was on earth, he had the form of humanity. And if we looked at him, just as his, apostle, his disciples who became apostles would have looked at him, and anybody else at his time, they looked at him and they saw a human. Even though he had many powerful works he was able to perform, the form that he had was that of a human. And so he had the form of God beforehand, but we're told that he emptied himself, just emptied himself of that and took the form of a servant, even the form of a human. And even then he humbled himself further. What an example to us of one who showed humility. God himself 
serves us. He served us by creating us. He serves us by sustaining us. We've seen this before when we were reading in the Gospel of John and, and in the letters of John. But also he humbles himself as well so that he, he can be reconciled to us. That God and humanity can be reconciled in the person of Christ. These are things we've picked up before. But he was God. He was in the form of God. And what about this saying, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Here's where people perhaps come unstuck when they want to tr twist these particular words. He didn't try to hold on to that. He willingly released that and emptied himself to become a human. That, that word to be grasped can have a couple of different meanings. It can mean that um, you hold on to something. And in this case, he was willing not to hold on to it. Or it can mean that you try to seize something. And that's the, the context in which this word is very often used in the Greek in trying to seize something. Um, and, and this is where it's very often twisted in this context by suggesting that Jesus didn't want to seize being like God. He was quite happy to be a human. But that's not what this is saying. This really is not what he's saying. Um, what it's saying here is that he, he wasn't holding on to it. And even if it was to be put the way around that it's twisted to be put around too, that he, he had become a human and he wasn't seizing the idea of being equal with God like the devil did perhaps, as we see in the stories in the Garden of Eden. Um, even if he, if he it was to be taken in that kind of a context, that he wasn't willing to seize equality with God. Whether you read it that way or not, we see that immediately after that, He's been exalted. He's got the name above every name. He's, he's got a name that's above any name you might otherwise attribute to God. Equality is, is given to him at the very least. Or in this particular case, the way Paul really means it, I would suggest, is that it's returned to him. Once he's done all that he intended to do by emptying himself, he then effectively refilled himself. That's a clunky way of putting it. But refilled himself with deity. Um, the Catechism puts it a different way as well. It talks about when he came to earth in, his, in what's called his humiliation. Um, he took to himself a true body and a reasonable soul. The idea being there that you know, he, he added to himself something he never had before. He took to himself humanity. God had never been in, in human form in that sense before so fully. And he did that by emptying himself effectively of his divinity. How on earth all that works is a very good question. At the end of the day, we're talking about something that God did, um, and, and it's not something we can do. So it's not as if it's something we can replicate or, or examine by science or anything like that. But taking Paul's words at face value and taking other passages of Scripture at face value as well, we'll talk about the work of Christ. We find that, there, yes, there he was as the Son of God, but he entered himself, he came to earth to be as a human and to, to suffer as a human. Um, and he wasn't just content with just being a human and leading the high life, but he, he was um, perfectly happy because of what he had to do, what he wanted to do, uh, for the joy that was set before him to, to, to release all of creation by what he would do by, by his, his work of, of redemption um, in, in coming to the earth and, and then further humbling himself uh, all the way to death on the cross. Um, but, but that was what he desired to do for you. And for me, some encouragement to be had in that, and also strong, strong encouragement to be humble as well. If Christ, from where he was, could be as humble as he was, you know, we're starting a, a lower bar or a lower rung on the ladder, so to speak. What wouldn't we do to be able to serve one another and, and be humble within it as well? That's our thought for today. In all that we have in life, and all that we we do in life, and all that we meet in life. We're encouraged not to think too much of ourselves. And, and that's maybe a life lesson, because that way we don't get knocked down a peg or two if we've already taken ourselves there. But with those thoughts in mind, let's have a wee word of prayer and continue with our day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for your, your goodness to us. Uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks to you for the way that you humbled yourself for the sake of us. And we pray that we too might be humble in your presence and humble in one another's presence as well. Help us where we have lessons to learn in that regard, that in the final day we might be exalted and glorified 
even as Christ himself has been glorified to the highest station. We pray, Lord, that uh, we might never be ashamed, neither in this life nor that to come, by putting you first and putting one another first in all that we attempt to do. So bless us, please, this day as we attempt to do it, and continue with us for the sake of Christ. Amen. We'll continue to look more at this bundle of letters. It's a slightly different letter, the next chapter, and probably another letter again, the following chapter again, if that theory that it's three different letters is to be believed. But we'll see how that goes on with these next two chapters. We'll look at the next chapter tomorrow. I hope you'll join me again. Until then, God bless, take care, and bye for now.